from Microbe TV, this is Beyond the Noise, episode number 41, recorded on July 10th, 2024. I am Vincent Racaniello, and joining me today is your host, Dr. Paul Offit. Hi, Vincent. This is the video version of Paul's column on Substack called Beyond the Noise, cutting to the chase on important health topics. And this week's column is called H5N1 Influenza Virus Bird Flu is Unlikely to Become a Human Pandemic. So let's take a look at that. And let's start, Paul, by having you give us a little bit of history about avian H5N1 influenza viruses in humans. Sure. So I guess in my medical lifetime, this is the third time there's been a scare regarding this particular H5 bird flu virus. So um, in 1997, there was a three-year-old boy who died in Hong Kong. It was unclear why. And when the CDC went out there to investigate, they found that he was infected with an unusual virus, this so-called H5 virus. And typically, when you see um, human pandemics, um, there oh, and there's two to three human influenza pandemics per century. They're they're caused typically by H1, H2, or H3 viruses, not H5 viruses. But here was a virus that for which there was virtually no uh, population immunity in the in the world that that had now killed this boy. And so what they found was that this was primarily a disease of chickens. In fact, it was killing seven out of every 10 chickens in that particular area in Hong Kong and then spread to other areas in Southeast Asia. And so millions of chickens were killed. Eventually, the virus spread to people and 18 people were infected with this virus and six died. That's a mortality rate of 33 percent for a virus that typically kills influenza typically kills less than 2% of its victims. So it's high mortality rate, but only 18 people were uh, infected. And so people were waiting for this virus to become a human pandemic. And it didn't, not that year, not the next year, not the year after. But then six years later, in 2003, 2005, bird flu or H5 virus again raised its head. Um, This time again, it was in Southeast Asia and you saw that the virus now um, spread not only uh, to to chickens and, and other sort of forms of birds, but it also spread to mammals, mice, cats, people. And eventually the, this virus um, caused 97 people to be infected, 55 of whom died. So again, a very high mortality rate. Now, for the last 20 years, um, this virus has infected maybe 900 people, roughly 50 people per year. Again, the mortality rate is high. But now you see it again raising its head in the United States. So dairy farm workers, initially one in Texas, then another one in Texas, then one in Michigan, uh, became infected with this H5 virus. So, So will this become a pandemic? Now, I, um, uh, I wrote a book about a man named Maurice Hilleman, who was in many ways the father of modern vaccines. He um, was the first person ever to, to predict a pandemic in 1957 caused by one of the typical strains, an H2 strain. And he predicted that this virus would never cause a human pandemic. But we'll see. And here's that book. <laughs> right, that's it. Vaccinate One Man's Quest. To defeat the world's deadliest disease. I actually have two copies of it. Not sure why. <laughs> I have read it. Check that out. Why did Maurice Hillman in 2005 predict that H5 would never become a human pandemic? So bird viruses, in order to become a pandemic, have to adapt themselves to humans. So the H1 and H2 and H3 viruses have done that because they've been able to adapt themselves to binding to receptors in the upper respiratory tract you know, the, the windpipe and then the first breathing tube, the big breathing tube, the bronchi. And when the virus can do that, when it can adapt to binding to that receptor, the so-called alpha-2,6 sialic acid receptor, then it can reproduce itself in the upper respiratory tract, which allows two things to occur. One, it means that it can easily be transmitted from coughing or sneezing or even uh, talking. And it also amplifies the virus, where hundreds of virus particles can become millions of virus particles that then travel down to the lower respiratory tract, the lung, and cause pneumonia and death. And that's the way the H1, H2, and H3 viruses work, because they've all adapted to bind themselves to this so-called alpha-2 
6 binding receptor. Now, the H5 viruses haven't done that, not yet, but I think we need to constantly be on the lookout to make sure that those viruses don't adapt themselves to binding to the, the cells in the upper respiratory tract, because then I think you do have a pandemic potential virus. So we know that you can change the, the hemagglutinin of H5N1 viruses in the laboratory so that they can bind alpha-2,6 amino acids. But maybe there are other reasons why, beyond that, the virus can't cause a pandemic in humans. Right. No, it's a really good point. And, and so I guess I, I um, am somewhat reassured by the fact that this virus has probably been around for about 100 years, but has never caused a human pandemic. But And I'm not sure why... Um, it is not of an, adva an advantage to the virus to adapt itself to humans, but it hasn't yet. So Louise Monkla, who is at the uh, University of Pennsylvania, you may know of her. Uh, she's been on Twivo and Twiv. Uh, some years ago, she did a deep sequencing study of H5 influenza viruses from birds uh, and humans in Cambodia. And she can find some viruses with the, the, the amino acid change that allows binding to alpha-2,6, but they never take off. So maybe it's not enough. Maybe there are other things and maybe they're not compatible. Who knows? Yeah, and I don't know if you saw, there was recently a paper in Nature that, that the embargo was just lifted a couple of days ago. Eisfeld, E-I-S-F-E-L-D, was the first author. I think he was out of the University of Wisconsin-Madison. But they looked at, at both H1N1 strains and H5N1 strains. And one of those H5N1 strains was from bovine origin, cow origin. And they did find, at least in the laboratory, that that virus could bind to alpha-2-6. And then they infected mice, they infected ferrets, and ferrets are essentially the experimental animal model to study influenza. And what they found was that when they inoculated ferret, ferrets with fairly high titers of virus, that you did get uh, re replication or reproduction of the virus in the upper respiratory tract. So it could bind to alpha-2-6 and it could reproduce in the upper respiratory tract. What didn't make sense in that particular paper was when they then put the ferret in, in contact with other ferrets who, ferrets who hadn't been exposed to the virus, that the transmissibility was very poor which didn't make sense. So you had a virus that reproduced itself well in the upper respiratory tract, apparently was amplified in the upper respiratory tract, yet still didn't appear to be transmissible. So I'm, I'm not sure uh, why they had that variance in that paper, but it's certainly something to watch out for. Yeah, I think that we have to be careful about oversimplifying, you know, requirements for, for being a pandemic virus. Certainly you have to bind alpha-2-6, but there may be other things as well. Um, uh, this reminds me of a paper published by uh, Kanta Subarau a number of years ago showing that the soft palate of humans is an important selection place for influenza viruses. They took the 2009 H1N1 human pandemic virus. They changed it so that it would now uh, bind uh, alpha-2,3 sialic acids, right? And they infected the, the uh, upper tract of ferrets, which has mostly alpha-2-6, and um, rapidly viruses were selected that would bind alpha-2-6. Uh, and so th there's a strong selection for that in the upper tract. Even though there's no alpha-2-3, you could select from a population of viruses that have maybe a few that can bind alpha-2-6, but we don't see that happening, right? So that's the thing. As you said, 100 years, we haven't seen it. And that's an interesting point in science. If you haven't seen something for a hundred years, does that mean that it will never happen? No. <laughs> Probably not. I think one should assume that anything can happen and be prepared for it. So, you know, in general, prediction is probably not a great thing to do in science, don't you think, Paul? <laughs> right. You can predict, but you may find yourself wrong. So in this case, um, I think we should be ready for an H5 pandemic, don't, don't you think? Yes. And you, yes. you do talk a little bit about vaccines. What do we have available for H5 viruses? So, so there are two vaccines, um, one of which is made um, in the United States. Actually, they're both made in the United States by a company called CSL Securus, which manufactures um, their influenza viruses in North Carolina. And, and the one that they have for, that is available in the United States um, is and has been licensed really by the Food and Drug Administration since 2020 is an H5N1 vaccine uh, 
Um, it's grown in mammalian cells in, in really an identical manner to a mammalian uh, flu vaccine called flu cellvax. It's then adjuvanted with um, an adjuvant called MF59, which is a squalene-based sort of oil and water emulsion adjuvant. Um, it's available as a two-dose vaccine for anybody over six months of age with those two doses given 21 days apart. Now, although it is available and licensed, it has not been recommended yet for high-risk groups in the United States. Now, that contrasts with a vaccine that's available in Europe, and the and and uh, the European Union has bought 15 million doses of this vaccine, also made by CSL Securus. Um, it's, it's similar in, the, in that it's an H5 vaccine, but it's an H5 and 8 vaccine, so not exactly the same. It's also a two-dose vaccine. It's also adjuvanted. This one is not grown in mammalian cells. It's grown in eggs, um, but it also is adjuvanted with this MF59 adjuvant and available for anybody over 18, again, as a two-dose vaccine. Now, the difference here is that Finland has now recommended that vaccine for high-risk groups, high-risk groups being scientists who work with H5 viruses, veterinarians, people who work in dairy farms, people who work in poultry farms, people, people who work in fur farms, like for minks or foxes, which are also susceptible to this virus. And um, I, I suspect that this country, were there to be another, say, dozen or so cases in dairy workers or poultry workers here, that they may have a recommendation for high-risk groups in this country, because it is a licensed product. We also have antivirals for influenza, and I assume they would be effective against H5 viruses as well. That's right. Neuraminidase inhibitors still work well because the neuraminidase hasn't uh, evolved. And don't forget the uh, endonuclease inhibitor, which, um, what's the name of it? Uh, and you've discussed it on Twib before, too, this one. Yeah. Um, Zofluza, right? Right. Which inhibits a different protein from the neuraminidase. It's not used very much. In fact, Daniel has said he doesn't use it, uh, but it's very effective and, and maybe more so than the neuraminidase inhibitors. So at least we have those two. F final uh, issue is that um, a number of years ago, Michael Warby published a paper showing that, uh, as you know, imprinting with your first influenza virus infection is really important for protection against subsequent infections. And he found that in people over 65, there's evidence that they get less severe H5 infections because they've, re they've previously encountered a virus that looked more like H5 than other people have. So all these things may mitigate a, a pandemic severity. So, so that's one advantage of being older then, you're saying? It's probably the only one, right? <laughs> All right, last question, Paul. Why is the media whipping up such a frenzy about H5N1 avian influenza virus? Every time there's a, a new case in a, in a dairy worker, they, the headlines go crazy. Why is that? In part because we're coming off COVID, where a new pandemic virus caused 700 million cases uh, in the world and 7 million deaths. And so we're still, I think, in post-traumatic stress disorder state of that. <laughs> and so you're just sort of waiting for the next uh hammer to fall. And, you know, that this vac virus, SARS-CoV-2, was the third uh, pandemic uh, virus, pandemic coronavirus in the last 20 years. So there'll be other pandemic viruses. And I, I think that's probably partly ex explains what, what happened. Well, we will put a link to this column in the show notes. That's Beyond the Noise with Dr. Paul Offit. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Vincent. Thank you.